Section sixty four of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. Writing a Charm, about seventeen ninety five, by Mungo Park. I travelled by the side of the river until sunset, when I came to Kulikuru, a considerable town and a great market for salt. Here I took up my lodging at the house of a Bambaran who had formerly been the slave of a moor, and in that character had travelled to Aron, Taudini, and many other places in the great desert. But turning Mussulman, and his master dying at Jeanne, he obtained his freedom, and settled at this place, where he carries on a considerable trade in salt, cotton cloth, etc. His knowledge of the world had not lessened that superstitious confidence in safis, amulets, and charms which he had imbibed in his earlier years for when he heard that i was a christian he immediately thought of procuring a safi and for this purpose brought out his walla or writing board assuring me that he would dress me a supper of rice if i would write him a safi to protect him from wicked men the proposal was of too great consequence to me to be refused i therefore wrote the board full from top to bottom on both sides and my landlord, to be certain of having the whole force of the charm, washed the writing from the board into a calabash with a little water, and having said a few prayers over it, drank this powerful draught. After which, lest a single word should escape, he licked the board until it was quite dry. A saffy writer was a man of too great consequence to be long concealed. The important information was carried to the duty, who sent his son with half a sheet of writing paper, desiring me to write him a nephula safi, a charm to procure wealth. He brought me as a present some bread and milk, and when I had finished the safi, and read it to him with an audible voice, he seemed highly satisfied with his bargain, and promised to bring me in the morning some milk for my breakfast. End of section 64. This recording is in the public domain. Section 65 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 3, Egypt, Africa, and Arabia, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 65. A Zealous Missionary. About 1795. By Mungo Park. The King of Futatora inflamed with a zeal for propagating his religion, had sent an embassy to Demel. The ambassador on the present occasion was accompanied by two of the principal Bushreens, who carried each a large knife, fixed on the top of a long pole. As soon as he had procured admission into the presence of Demel, and announced the pleasure of his sovereign, he ordered the Bushreens to present the emblems of his mission. The two knives were accordingly laid before Demel, and the ambassador explained himself as follows. With this knife, said he, Abdul Qadar will condescend to shave the head of Demel, if Demel will embrace the Mohammedan faith. And with this other knife, Abdul Qadar will cut the throat of Demel, if Demel refuses to embrace it. Take your choice. Demel coolly told the ambassador that he had no choice to make. He neither chose to have his head shaved nor his throat cut. And with this answer the ambassador was civilly dismissed. Abdul Qadar took his measures accordingly, and with a powerful army invaded Demel's country. The inhabitants of the towns and villages filled up their wells, destroyed their provisions, carried off their effects, and abandoned their dwellings as he approached. By this means he was led on from place to place, until he had advanced three days' journey into the country of the Jalofs. He had indeed met with no opposition, but his army had suffered so much from the scarcity of water that several of his men had died by the way. This induced him to direct his march towards a watering place in the woods, where his men, having quenched their thirst and being overcome with fatigue, lay down carelessly to sleep among the bushes. In this situation they were attacked by Demel before daybreak and completely routed. Many of them were trampled to death as they lay asleep by the Jalof horses. Others were killed in attempting to make their escape, and a still greater number were taken prisoners. Among the latter was Abdul Qadar himself. 
this ambitious or rather frantic prince who but a month before had sent the threatening message to demel was now himself led into his presence as a miserable captive the behavior of demel on this occasion is never mentioned by the singing men but in terms of the highest approbation and it was indeed so extraordinary in an african prince that the reader may find it difficult to give credit to the recital when his royal prisoner was brought before him in irons and thrown upon the ground the magnanimous demel instead of setting his foot upon his neck and stabbing him with his spear according to custom in such cases addressed him as follows abdul Qadar, answer me this question if the chance of war had placed me in your situation and you in mine how would you have treated me i would have thrust my spear into your heart returned abdul Qadar with great firmness and i know that a similar fate awaits me not so said demel my spear is indeed red with the blood of your subjects slain in battle and i could now give it a deeper stain by dipping it in your own but this would not build up my towns nor bring to life the thousands who fell in the woods i will not therefore kill you in cold blood but i will retain you as my slave until i perceive that your presence in your own kingdom will be no longer dangerous to your neighbors and then i will consider of the proper way of disposing of you abdul Qadar was accordingly retained and worked as a slave for three months at the end of which period demel listened to the solicitations of the inhabitants of fudatora and restored to them their king strange as this story may appear i have no doubt of the truth of it it was told to me at malacotta by the negroes it was afterwards related to me by the europeans on the gambia by some of the french at goree and confirmed by nine slaves who were taken prisoners along with abdul Qadar by the watering place in the woods and carried in the same ship with me to the west indies end of section sixty five recording by philip gould Section 66 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 3, Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 66. A Visit to King Moselekatse. 1829. By Anne Manning Rathbone. One day, towards the end of 1829, Moffat received two very unexpected visitors. Footnote. Robert Moffat, the well-known missionary. End footnote. They were chiefs from the court of a mighty king in the Far East, whose name was Moselekatse. He was quite beyond the range of ordinary travelers, but the rumor of his dark and terrible deeds has extended far beyond the precincts of the countries immediately surrounding his dominions, and he had heard somewhat of the white men and wanted to know more about them these visitors were entirely destitute of clothing and were surprised to find it considered necessary but with the good breeding that is a true mark of high birth and real politeness were immediately willing to adopt whatever was thought seemly for them they were shown every mark of attention which they received with a graceful ease that showed they were the nobles of the nation to which they belonged though they dropped no hint of it themselves everything calculated to interest them was shown to them the dwellings the walls of the folds and gardens the water ditch conveying a large stream of water from the river and the smith's forge filled them with admiration and astonishment not of a vulgar unintelligent kind but of minds capable of appreciating what was shown and explained to them for the first time you are men we are but children to you said they moselekatse must be told of these things while standing in the hall of moffat's house looking at the strange furniture of a civilized abode one of them observed a small looking-glass on which he gazed with surprise and admiration mrs moffat put into his hand one which was considerably larger he looked intently at his reflected countenance and never having seen it before supposed it was one of his attendants on the other side and abruptly put his hand behind it telling him to be gone but looking again at the same face he cautiously turned it and seeing nothing he returned the glass with great gravity to mrs moffat saying that he could not trust it nothing appeared to strike them so forcibly as the public worship in the chapel they saw men behaving themselves with the utmost decorum mothers stilling their babes or carrying them out if they cried and children sitting perfectly still and silent 
the order and fervor which pervaded the services bewildered their minds and they were surprised that the hymns they heard sung were not war songs these chiefs told moffat that they were under considerable doubt of being able to return home in safety as they had heard that the Betuana tribes were plotting to waylay and destroy them and they asked his advice after consultation with mrs moffat and mr hamilton he offered to accompany them as far as the bahurutse country from which they could proceed without difficulty to their own land and people the strangers most gratefully accepted this kind offer their eyes glistening with delight a wagon was hired for their accommodation in addition to moffat's own the delightful results of christian fellowship were apparent in the friendliness and generosity of the residents at the station in offering little gifts as keepsakes to their visitors whom in their unconverted state they could only have cursed in their hearts and perhaps with their lips having obtained a sufficient number of volunteers to accompany him on what some thought a very hazardous journey moffat started with his grateful friends on the ninth of november though the road had its perils from wild beasts there were none from the natives having safely conveyed his companions to the bahurutsi he was then about to take leave of them but they so earnestly begged him to add to his kindness by accompanying them to their own country that at length he consented the country through which they now travelled was quite different from that which they had left it was mountainous and wooded and had numerous streams of excellent water but the surrounding stillness was often broken by the lion's roar having reached the outposts of moselekatsi's dominions moffat was again purposing to return home but the two chiefs arose and umbate the elder of them laid his right hand on his shoulder and his left on his own breast and said very earnestly my father you have been our guardian we are yours and will you leave us yonder dwells the great moselekatse and how shall we approach his presence if you are not with us if you love us still save us for when we shall have told our news he will ask why our conduct gave you pain and induced your return and before the sun goes down we shall be ordered for execution because you are not with us look at me and my companion and tell us if you can that you will not go for we had better die here than in the sight of our people he argued but to no effect are you afraid said the other no said moffat then pursued umbate it remains with you to save our lives and our wives and children from sorrow it must be owned that they were adepts in persuasion and in short moffat yielded to their great joy as well as to that of his own attendants on the surface of the country through which they now travelled lay the ruins of innumerable towns showing what disastrous wars must have raged to render them now without inhabitants heaps of stone and rubbish were mingled with human skulls which told their ghastly tale passing over some hills to the right they fell into their surprise with berend and a large hunting party with whom had travelled a wesleyan missionary named archbell who had gone on three days before to visit moselekatse who however had refused to see him on approaching the capital one of the chiefs went forward to appear before the king and pave the way for his companions there said mbate pointing to the crown dwells the great king pezulu that is king of heaven the elephant the lion's paw with many other sounding titles moffat mr archbell and two others mounted their horses and rode directly to the town on entering the great fold which was capable of holding ten thousand head of cattle they were rather taken by surprise to find it lined by eight hundred warriors besides two hundred who were concealed on each side of the entrance as if in ambush they were beckoned to dismount which they did holding the horses bridles in their hands the warriors of the gate instantly rushed in with hideous yells that frightened the horses and then fell into rank with as much order as if they had been accustomed to european tactics all was silent as the grave while the men were motionless as statues eyes only were seen to move and there was a rich display of fine white teeth after some minutes of profound silence the war song burst forth there was harmony it is true but of a terrific kind especially when they imitated the groans of the dying and the yells and hissings of the conquerors after another profound silence during which the missionary still stood at pause out marched the monarch from behind the lines followed by a number of men bearing baskets and bowls of food he came up to his visitors and gave each a clumsy but hearty shake of the hand he then turned to the food which had been placed at their feet and politely invited them to partake of it 
by this time the wagons appeared in the distance and the missionaries having requested him to inform them where they should take up their quarters he accompanied them holding moffat by the arm though not in the most graceful way yet with perfect ease and familiarity the land is before you said he heartily you are come to your son you may sleep where you please when the moving houses as he called the wagons drew near he grasped moffat's arm very tightly and though himself the terror of thousands looked on them with fear as doubtful whether they were not living creatures when the oxen were unyoked he approached the wagons with the utmost caution still holding moffat with one hand and laying the other on his mouth in token of surprise he examined them intently especially the wheels and could not think how the large band of iron surrounding the fellows of the wheel came to be all in one piece umbate stepped forward to explain my eyes saw that very hand said he pointing to moffat's cut those bars of iron take a piece off one end and then join them as you see did he give medicine to the iron asked the king in surprise no replied umbate he used nothing but fire a hammer and a chisel Moselekatse then returned to the town where the warriors still standing as he had left them received him with immense bursts of applause Moselekatse did not fail to supply his visitors abundantly with meat milk and a harmless kind of beer he seemed desirous to please and to appear to the best advantage the following day he treated them to a grand public ball in their honor and asked moffat if he had seen anything equal to it in his own country he afterwards said to him my father you have made my heart as white as milk i cease not to wonder at the love of a stranger you never saw me before but you loved me more than my own people you fed me when i was hungry you clothed me when i was naked and taking moffat's right arm in his hand that arm shielded me from my enemies you did it to these two men you clothed them you fed them you protected them you did it unto me thus ended the saturday of this eventful week the following morning was marked by a melancholy display of the so-called heroism which prefers death to dishonor the king gave a great feast many oxen had been slaughtered everybody was merry except one of his chief officers called an intuna this young man had been guilty of an unpardonable crime and was sentenced to immediate death by being thrown from a rock into a river full of crocodiles which would devour him in an instant there was not a tear in his bright black eye but he looked very sad while moffat begged his life of the king the intuna knelt before him mose Lekatse said while everybody listened in the deepest silence you are a dead man but i shall do to-day what i never did before i spare your life for the sake of my friend and father pointing to moffat i know his heart weeps at the shedding of blood for his sake i spare your life he has travelled from a far country to see me and he has made my heart white but he told me that to take away life is an awful thing and can never be repaired i wish him when he returns to his own home to return with a heart as white as he has made mine i spare you for his sake for i love him and he has saved the lives of my people but you must be degraded for life you must no more associate with the nobles of the land nor enter into the assemblies of the princes of the people go to the poor of the field and let your companions henceforth be the inhabitants of the deserts the sentence passed the pardoned man was expected to bow in grateful adoration to him who he was accustomed to look upon and exalt in songs only applicable to one whom belongs universal dominion but no holding his hands clasped on his bosom he replied o king afflict not my heart i have merited thy displeasure let me be slain like the warrior i cannot live with the poor and raising his hand to the ring he wore on his brow he continued how can i live among the dogs of the king and disgrace these badges of honor which i won among the spears and shields of the mighty no i cannot live let me die o pezulu his request was granted and his hands tied erect over his head moffat's exertions to save his life were in vain he disdained the boon on the conditions offered preferring to die with the honors he had won at the point of the spear which even the act that condemned him did not tarnish he was led forth a man walking on each side till he reached the top of a precipice over which he was precipitated into the deep pool of the river beneath where the crocodiles accustomed to such meals 
were waiting to devour him. End of section 66. Recording by Philip Gould. Section 67 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. Read for LibriVox.org by Philip Gould. The Mountain with Several Caves by David Livingston. 1854. Livingston brought with him to the town of Luanda a party of the tribe known as Makalolo. This was their first visit to a city. The editor. Everyone remarked the serious deportment of the Makalolo. They viewed the large stone houses and churches in the vicinity of that great ocean with awe. A house with two stories was until now beyond their comprehension. In explanation of this strange thing I had always been obliged to use the word for hut and as huts are constructed by the poles being let into the earth, they never could comprehend how the poles of one hut could be founded upon the roof of another, or how men could live in the upper story, with the conical roof of the lower one in the middle. Some Makalolo who had visited my little house at Kolobeng, in trying to describe it to their countrymen at Linyanti, said, It is not a hut. It is a mountain with several caves in it. Commander Bedingfield and Captain Skane invited them to visit their vessels, the Pluto and Philomel. Knowing their fears, I told them that no one need go if he entertained the least suspicion of foul play. Nearly the whole party went, and when on deck I pointed to the sailors, and said, Now these are my countrymen, sent by our queen for the purpose of putting down the trade of those that buy and sell black men. They replied, Truly, they are just like you and all their fears seemed to vanish at once, for they went forward among the men, and the jolly tars, acting much as the Makalolo would have done in similar circumstances, handed them a share of the bread and beef which they had for dinner. The commander allowed them to fire off a cannon, and having the most exalted ideas of its power, they were greatly pleased when I told them that is what they put down the slave trade with. The size of the brig of war amazed them. It is not a canoe at all. It is a town. The sailor's deck they named the Katla, and then, as a climax to their description of this great ark, added, And what sort of a town is it that you must climb up into with a rope? End of section 67. This recording is in the public domain. Section 68 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. Read for LibriVox.org. By Devora Allen. A Magic Lantern in Africa, 1854, by David Livingstone. Shinte was most anxious to see the pictures of the magic lantern, but fever had so weakening an effect, and I had such violent action of the heart, with buzzing in the ears, that I could not go for several days. When I did go for the purpose, he had his principal men and the same crowd of court beauties near him as at the reception. The first picture exhibited was Abraham about to slaughter his son Isaac. It was shown as large as life, and the uplifted knife was in the act of striking the lad. The Balonda men remarked that the picture was much more like a god than the things of wood or clay that they worshipped. I explained that this man was the first of a race to whom God had given the Bible we now held, and that among his children our Saviour appeared. The ladies listened with silent awe, but when I moved the slide, the uplifted dagger moving toward them, they thought it was to be sheathed in their bodies instead of Isaac's. "'Mother! Mother!' all shouted at once, and off they rushed helter-skelter, tumbling pell-mell over each other, and over the little idle huts and tobacco bushes. We could not get one of them back again. Shinte, however, sat bravely through the hole, and afterward examined the instrument with interest. End of section 68. This recording is in the public domain. Section 69 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. Read for LibriVox.org by Devorah Allen. The Electric Wind of the Desert. 1854. By David Livingstone. Occasionally, during the very hot seasons, which succeed our winter and precede our rains, a hot wind blows over the desert from north to south. It feels somewhat as if it came from an oven, and seldom blows longer at a time than three days. It resembles in its effects the Harmattan of the north of Africa, and at the time the missionaries first settled in the country, 
it came loaded with fine reddish-colored sand. Though no longer accompanied by sand, it is so devoid of moisture as to cause the wood of the best-seasoned English boxes and furniture to shrink, so that every wooden article not made in the country is warped. The verls of ramrods made in England are loosened, and on returning to Europe fastened again. This wind is in such an electric state that a bunch of ostrich feathers held a few seconds against it becomes as strongly charged as if attached to a powerful electric machine and clasps the advancing hand with a sharp, crackling sound. When this hot wind is blowing, and even at other times, the peculiarly strong electrical state of the atmosphere causes the movement of a native in his carosse to produce therein a stream of small sparks. The first time I noticed this appearance was while a chief was traveling with me in my wagon. Seeing part of the fur of his mantle, which was exposed to slight friction by the movement of the wagon, assume quite a luminous appearance, I rubbed it smartly with the hand, and found it readily gave out bright sparks, accompanied with distinct cracks. "'Don't you see this?' said I. "'The white men did not show us this,' he replied. "'We had it long before white men came into this country. We and our forefathers of old.'" End of section 69 This recording is in the public domain. Section 70 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia Read for LibriVox.org by Robin Cook The Merman Missionary, 1854 By David Livingstone Our friends informed us that Shinte would be highly honored by the presence of three white men in his town at once. Two others had sent forward notice of their approach from another quarter, the West. Could it be Barth or Kropf? How pleasant to meet with Europeans in such an out-of-the-way region. The rush of thoughts made me almost forget my fever. Are they of the same color as I am? Yes, exactly so. And have the same hair? Is that hair? We thought it was a wig. We never saw the like before. This white man must be of the sort that lives in the sea. Henceforth my men took the hint and always sounded my praises as a true specimen of the variety of white men who live in the sea. Only look at his hair. It is made quite straight by the sea water. I explained to them again and again that, when it was said we came out of the sea, it did not mean that we came from beneath the water, but the fiction has been widely spread in the interior by the Mumbari that the real white men live in the sea, and the myth was too good not to be taken advantage of by my companions. So, notwithstanding my injunctions, I believed that, when I was out of hearing, my men always represented themselves as led by a genuine merman. Just see his hair! If I returned from walking to a little distance, they would remark of some to whom they had been holding forth, These people want to see your hair. As the strangers had woolly hair like themselves, I had to give up the idea of meeting anything more European than two half-case Portuguese engaged in trading for slaves, ivory, and beeswax. End of Section 70 This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Robin Cook, Flagstaff, Arizona, July 2018 Section 71 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 3, Egypt, Africa, and Arabia, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 71. How I Found Livingston, by Sir Henry M. Stanley. 1871. David Livingston was a celebrated African explorer and missionary. After many years in Africa, he was lost sight of, and it was generally believed that he was dead. James Gordon Bennett, proprietor of the New York Herald, determined to send the young reporter, who was afterwards known as Sir Henry M. Stanley, in search of him. Mr. Bennett was then in Paris. Five hours after receiving his telegram, come to Paris on important business, 
Mr. Stanley was on his way to learn what was wanted of him. He arrived at night. The Editor I went straight to the Grand Hotel and knocked at the door of Mr. Bennett's room. Come in, I heard a voice say. Entering, I found Mr. Bennett in bed. Who are you? he asked. My name is Stanley, I answered. Ah, yes, sit down. I have important business on hand for you. After throwing over his shoulder his robe de chambre, Mr. Bennett asked, Where do you think Livingston is? I really do not know, sir. Do you think he is alive? He may be. Then he may not be, I answered. Well, I think he is alive, and that he can be found, and I am going to send you to find him. What? said I. Do you really think I can find Dr. Livingston? Do you mean me to go to Central Africa? Yes. I mean that you shall go and find him wherever you may hear that he is, and to get what news you can of him, and perhaps, delivering himself thoughtfully and deliberately, the old man may be in want. Take enough with you to help him should he require it. Of course you will act according to your own plans and do what you think best, but find Livingston. Said I, wondering at the cool order of sending one to Central Africa to search for a man whom I, in common with almost all other men, believe to be dead. Have you considered seriously the great expense you are likely to incur on account of this little journey? What will it cost? he asked abruptly. Burton and Speke's journey to Central Africa costs between three thousand and five thousand pounds, and I fear it cannot be done under two thousand five hundred pounds. Well, I will tell you what you will do. Draw a thousand pounds now, and when you have gone through that, draw another thousand, and when that is spent, draw another thousand, and so on, but find Livingston. Two years later the following scene took place. We were now about three hundred yards from the village of Mujiji, and the crowds are dense about me. Suddenly I hear a voice on my right say, Good morning, sir. Startled at hearing this greeting in the midst of such a crowd of black people, I turn sharply around in search of the man and see him at my side with the blackest of faces, but animated and joyous. A man dressed in a long white shirt, with a turban of American sheeting around his woolly head, and I ask, Who the mischief are you? I am Susie, the servant of Dr. Livingston, said he, smiling and showing a gleaming row of teeth. What? Is Dr. Livingston here? Yes, sir. In this village? Yes, sir. Are you sure? Sure, sure, sir. Why, I leave him just now. Good morning, sir, said another voice. Hello, said I. Is this another one? Yes, sir. Well, what is your name? My name is Chuma, sir. What? Are you Chuma, the friend of Wakotani? Yes, sir. And is the doctor well? Not very well, sir. Where has he been so long? In Manuima. Now you, Susie, run and tell the doctor I am coming. Yes, sir. And off he darted like a madman. But by this time we were within two hundred yards of the village, and the multitude was getting denser and almost preventing our march. Flags and streamers were out. Arabs and Wangwana were pushing their way through the natives in order to greet us, for according to their account we belonged to them. But the great wonder of all was, how did you come from Onyanyembe? Soon Susi came running back and asked me my name. He had told the doctor that I was coming, but the doctor was too surprised to believe him. And when the doctor asked him my name, Susi was rather staggered. But during Susi's absence the news had been conveyed to the doctor that it was surely a white man that was coming, whose guns were firing and whose flag could be seen, and the great Arab magnates of Ujiji, Mohammed bin Sali, Said bin Majid, Abid bin Suleiman, Mohammed bin Garib, and others had gathered together before the doctor's house, and the doctor had come out from his veranda to discuss the matter and await my arrival. In the meantime the head of the expedition had halted, and the Kirangozi was out of the ranks, holding his flag aloft, and Selim said to me, I see the doctor, sir. Oh, what an old man! He has got a white beard. And I? 
what would I not have given for a bit of friendly wilderness, where unseen I might vent my joy in some mad freak, such as idiotically biting my hand, turning a somersault or slashing at trees, in order to allay those exciting feelings that were well-nigh uncontrollable. My heart beats fast, but I must not let my face betray my emotions, lest it shall detract from the dignity of a white man appearing under such extraordinary circumstances. So I did that which I thought was most dignified. I pushed back the crowds, and passing from the rear, walked down a living avenue of people until I came in front of the semicircle of Arabs, in the front of which stood the white man with the gray beard. As I advanced slowly towards him I noticed he was pale, looked wearied, had a gray beard, wore a bluish cap with a faded gold band around it, had on a red-sleeved waistcoat and a pair of gray tweed trousers. I would have run to him only I was a coward in the presence of such a mob, would have embraced him only he being an Englishman, I did not know how he would receive me. So I did what cowardice and false pride suggested was the best thing, walked deliberately to him, took off my hat and said, Dr. Livingston, I presume? Yes, said he, with a kind smile, lifting his cap slightly. I replace my hat on my head, and he puts on his cap, and we both grasp hands, and I then say aloud, I thank God, doctor, I have been permitted to see you. He answered, I feel thankful that I am here to welcome you. I turn to the Arabs, take off my hat to them in response to the saluting chorus of Yambos I receive, and the doctor introduces them to me by name. Then oblivious of the crowds, oblivious of the men who shared with me my dangers, we, Livingston and I, turn our faces towards his timbe. He points to the veranda, or rather mud platform, under the broad overhanging eaves. He points to his own particular seat, which I see his age and experience in Africa have suggested, namely a straw mat with a goatskin over it, and another skin nailed against the wall to protect his back from contact with the cold mud. I protest against taking this seat, which so much more befits him than me, but the doctor will not yield. I must take it. We are seated, the doctor and I, with our backs to the wall. The Arabs take seats on our left. More than a thousand natives are in our front, filling the whole square densely, indulging their curiosity, and discussing the fact of two white men meeting at Ujiji one just come from Manuema, in the west, and the other from Unyanyembe, in the east. Conversation began. What about? I declare I have forgotten. Oh, we mutually ask questions of one another, such as, How did you come here? And, Where have you been all this long time? The world has believed you to be dead. Yes, that was the way it began. But whatever the doctor himself informed me, and that which I communicated to him, I cannot correctly report. For I found myself gazing at him, conning the wonderful man at whose side I now sat in Central Africa. Every hair of his head and beard, every wrinkle of his face, the wanness of his features, and the slightly wearied look he wore, were all imparting intelligence to me. The knowledge I had craved for so much ever since I heard the words, Take what you want but find Livingston. End of section 71. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Philip Gould. Section 72 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia, read for LibriVox.org by phone. Western and Central Africa, Part 2. Adventures in the African Jungle. Historical Note. Du Chaillou had an exceedingly good preparation for his work as an African explorer, for he spent his youth on the west coast of Africa, where his father was trader and consul. When only twenty years of age, he set out on an exploration of that part of West Africa lying between two degrees north and two degrees south. He knew the native languages, and with only African helpers he travelled on foot more than eight thousand miles. He was probably the first white man who ever saw gorillas, and his reports of the behaviour of these animals, and of the tribes of pygmies that he had met, indeed of the extent of his explorations in general, were bitterly attacked. Du Chaillou had only used a compass, and so could not prove his records of travel, but he now set to work to learn how to use a camera and various kinds of astronomical instruments. Then he started on a second trip. Meanwhile, others had followed in his footsteps, and proof of his accuracy was afforded in generous supply. 
nevertheless he made a second journey to equatorial africa later he made explorations in scandinavia and in russia he died in 1903 at the age of 68 less is known of africa especially of its central portion than of any other continent its value however is so evident that during the last quarter of a century there has been a wild scramble among the countries of europe for african possessions england germany portugal france and italy hold either vast areas of land or spheres of influence that is land which they claim the right to occupy and develop abyssinia and the little republic of liberia are the only countries of africa which are free to carry on their own government as they choose end of section seventy two this recording is in the public domain section seventy three of egypt africa and arabia this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the world's story volume three egypt africa and arabia edited by eva march tappan section seventy three the village of dwarfs about eighteen hundred and seventy by paul du chaillu the day after i had done before the ashangos the wonderful things i have described to you as i was seated under the veranda of the king with mukonga and a few ashango elders i began to talk of the country and i said to them people say that there are dwarfs living in the forest is it so ashangos how far are they from niembuai at no great distance from this spot said the chief there is a village of them but o oh, guizi if you want to see them you must not go to them with a large number of attendants you must go in a small party take one of your komi men and i will give you my nephew who knows the dwarfs to go with you you must walk as cautiously as possible in the forest for those dwarfs are like antelopes and gazelles they are shy and easily frightened to see them you must take them by surprise no entreaty of ours could induce them to stay in their settlements if they knew you were coming if you are careful to-morrow we shall see them for as sure as i live there are dwarfs in the forest and they are called obongos early the next morning the ashango chief called one of his nephews and another ashango and ordered them to show me the way to the country of the dwarfs so we got ready to start i taking three of my komi men with me rabuka agalo and makandai i had put on a pair of light india rubber boots in order not to make any noise in the forest before leaving i gave a large bunch of beads to one of the ashango men and told him as soon as we made our appearance in the village to shout obongos do not run away look here at the beads which the spirit brings to you the spirit is your friend do not be afraid he comes only to see you after leaving niembuai we walked through the forest in the most cautious manner and as we approached the settlement the ashango man who was in the lead turned his head towards us put a finger on his lips for us to be silent and made a sign for us to walk very carefully and we advanced with more circumspection than ever after a while we came to the settlement of the dwarfs over a small area the undergrowth had been partially cut away and there stood twelve queer little houses which were the habitations of these strange people but not a dwarf was to be seen they had all gone nobody here shouted the ashangos and the echo of their voices alone disturbed the stillness of the forest i looked around at this strange little settlement of living dwarfs there was no mistake about it the fires were lighted the smoke ascended from the interior of their little shelters on a bed of charcoal embers there was a piece of snake roasting before another were two rats cooking on the ground there were several baskets of nuts and one of berries with some large wild fruits that had been gathered by the dwarfs in the woods while near by stood several calabashes filled with water and some bundles of dried fish 
there was indeed no mistake the huts i had seen on my way to niembuai were the same as these and had been made surely by the same race of dwarfs the ashogos had told me no idle stories i wish you could have seen the faces of rebuka igalo and makandai oh 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 they exclaimed shali what are we not going to see in the wild countries you bring us to these people must be niamas beasts for look said they pointing to their huts the shelters of the nshiego mbuve are quite as good i lingered a long while in the hope that the dwarfs would return but they did not we called for them but our voices were lost we followed some of their tracks but it was of no use you cannot overtake them said the ashangos for they can run through the jungle as fast as a gazelle and as silently as a snake and they are far off now they are afraid of you before leaving their settlement i hung on the lower branches of trees surrounding their village strings of beads of bright colours which i carried with me in my hunting-bag for i always had some ready to give away whenever i wanted to do so i had red white and yellow beads with me that day and the trees looked gay with these strings hanging from them we had taken goat meat for the dwarfs and i hung up three legs of goats also and several plantains and i put a little salt on a leaf near a hut and we departed so i hoped that the dwarf seeing what we had left behind us would become emboldened and see that we did not desire to do them harm and that the next time they would not be afraid of us i was pleased to perceive on our arrival in the evening at niembuai that the ashangos seemed glad to see us again though the chief was quite disappointed that we had not seen the little abongos that evening the ashangos clustered around me and wanted me to talk to them not in their own language but in the language of the oguizi spirits so i talked to them and their wonder was great and i read to them from a book all of them listening the while with their mouths wide open then i took my journal and read to them aloud in english and after reading the part which related to what i had done in the ishogo village of mokanga i translated it to them to the great delight of the ishogos the part i read related to my arrival in mokanga how the people were afraid of me and what warm friends we became and how the villagers said i had moved the big boulder of granite at this there was a tremendous shout then i said ashangos the aguizis do not forget anything what i write will always be remembered now i will read you something we have from an aguizi who wrote about dwarfs the name of that aguizi was herodotus and yours shouted the ashangos is shali that aguizi herodotus i continued wrote about what he heard and what he saw just as i do long long ago before any tree of the forest round you had come out of the ground i could not count in their language and say about two thousand three hundred years ago that oguizi herodotus travelled just as i am travelling to-day oh oh shouted the ashangos mamo mamo shouted the ishogos listen listen said my comey men in english for they all now could talk a little english and he writes i did hear indeed what i will now relate from certain natives of cyrene once upon a time when they were on a visit to the oracular shrine of amon when it chanced in the course of conversation with the tiarchus the ammonian king the talk fell upon the nile how that its source was unknown to all men etiarchus upon this mentioned that some nasamonians had come to his court and when asked if they could give any information concerning the uninhabited parts of libya had told the following tale the nasamonians are a libyan race who occupy the sotis and a tract of no great size toward the east they said there had grown up among them some wild young men the sons of certain chiefs who when they came to man's estate indulged in all manner of extravagances and among other things drew lots for five of their number to go and explore the desert parts of libya and try if they could not penetrate farther than any had done previously 
the coast of libya along the sea which washes it to the north throughout its entire length from egypt to cape soloeus which is its farthest point is inhabited by libyans of many distinct tribes who possess the whole tract except certain portions which belong to the phoenicians and the greeks above the coast-line and the country inhabited by the maritime tribes libya is full of wild beasts while beyond the wild beast region there is a tract which is wholly sand and very scant of water and utterly and entirely a desert the young men therefore dispatched on this errand by their comrades with a plentiful supply of water and provisions travelled at first through the inhabited region passing which they came to the wild beast track whence they finally entered upon the desert which they proceeded to cross in a direction from east to west after journeying for many days over a wide extent of land they came at last to a plain where they observed trees growing approaching them and seeing fruit on them they proceeded to gather it while they were thus engaged there came upon them some dwarfish men under the middle height who seized them and carried them off the nasamonians did not understand a word of their language nor had they any acquaintance with the language of the nasamonians they were carried across extensive marshes and finally came to a city in which all the men were of a height of their conductors and dark complexioned a great river flowed by the city running from west to east and containing crocodiles etearchus conjectured this river to be the nile and reason favours this idea oh oh shouted my comey men it is no wonder that the white man forgets nothing shally will what you write about the strange things we see be remembered in the same manner with what that man herodotus wrote i do not know said i if the white people think that what we saw is worthy of preservation it will be remembered if not it will be forgotten but never mind i said let us see for ourselves and what a tale we shall have to tell to our people on our return for what we see no other men have ever seen before us after my story of herodotus the shades of evening had come and a great jashango dance took place how wild how strange the dancing was in the temple or house of the mabuiti idol the idol was a huge representation of a woman and it stood at the end of the temple which was about fifty feet in length and only ten feet broad the extremity of the building where the mabuiti was kept was also dark and looked weird by the light of the torches as i entered it was painted in red white and black along the walls on each side were ashango men seated on the ground each having a lighted torch before him in the centre were two mbuiti men doctor priest dressed with fibres of trees round their waist each had one side of his face painted white and the other side red down the middle of the breast they had a broad yellow stripe and the hollow of the eye was painted yellow they make these different colours from different woods the colouring matter of which they mix with clay all the ashangos were also streaked and daubed with various colours and by the light of their torches they looked like a troop of devils assembled on the earth to celebrate some diabolical rite round their legs were bound sharp pointed white leaves from the heart of the palm tree some wore feathers others had leaves behind their ears and all had a bundle of palm leaves in their hands they did not stir when i came in i told them not to stop that i came only to look at them they began by making all kinds of contortions and set up a deafening howl of wild songs there was an orchestra of instrumental performers near the idol consisting of three drummers beating as hard as they could with their sticks on two nagomas tam-tams one harper and another man strumming with all his might on a sounding-board the two mbuiti men danced in a most fantastic manner jumping and twisting their bodies into all sorts of shapes and contortions every time the mbuiti men opened their mouths to speak a dead silence ensued now and then the men would all come and dance round the mbuiti men and then they would all face the idol dance before it and sing songs of praise to it i could not stand this noise long so i left my ashangos to enjoy themselves and as usual before retiring ordered my men to keep their watch in a proper manner 
don't be disheartened said the chief of niembuai to me after my unsuccessful attempt to see the dwarfs i told you before that the little obongos were as shy as the antelopes and gazelles of the woods you have seen for yourself now that what i said was true if you are careful when you go again to their settlement you will probably surprise them only don't wait long before going again for they may move away before sunrise the next morning we started again for the settlement of the little dwarfs we were still more cautious than before in going through the jungle this time we took another direction to reach them lest perhaps they might be watching the path by which we had come before after a while i thought i saw through the trunks of the trees ahead of us several little houses of the dwarfs i kept still and immediately gave a sign to make my guides maintain silence they obeyed me on the instant and we lay motionless on the ground hardly daring to breathe there was no mistake about it we could see as we peeped through the trees the houses of the dwarfs but there seemed to be no life there no abongos we kept watching for more than half an hour in breathless silence when lo rebuka gave a tremendous sneeze i looked at him i wish you had seen his face another sneeze was coming and he was trying hard to prevent it and made all sorts of faces but the look i gave him was enough i suppose and the second sneeze was suppressed then we got up and entered a little settlement of the dwarfs there was not one of them there the village had been abandoned the leaves over the little houses were dry and while we were looking all round suddenly our bodies were covered with swarms of fleas which drove us out faster than we came it was awful for they did bite savagely as if they had not had anything to feed upon for a whole month we continued to walk very carefully and after a while we came near another settlement of the dwarfs which was situated in the densest part of the forest i see the huts we crossed the little stream from which the dwarfs drew their water to drink how careful we are as we walk toward their habitations our bodies bent almost double in order not to be easily discovered i am excited oh i would give so much to see the dwarfs to speak to them how craftily we advance how cautious we are for fear of alarming the shy inmates my ashango guides hold bunches of beads i see that the beads we had hung to the trees have been taken away all our caution was in vain the dwarf saw us and ran away in the woods we rushed but it was too late they had gone but as we came into the settlement i thought i saw three creatures lying flat on the ground and crawling through their small doors into their houses when we were in the very midst of the settlement i shouted is there anybody here no answer the ashango shouted is there anybody here no answer i said to the ashangos i am certain that i have seen some of the dwarfs go into their huts then they shouted again is there anybody here the same silence turning toward me my guide said oguizi your eyes have deceived you there is no one here they have all fled they are afraid of you i am not mistaken i answered i went with one ashango toward one of the huts where i thought i had seen one of the dwarfs go inside to hide and as i came to the little door i shouted again is there anybody here no answer the ashango shouted is there anybody inside no answer i told you o Gweezy, that they have all run away it did seem queer to me that i should have suffered an optical delusion i was perfectly sure that i had seen three dwarfs get inside of their huts perhaps they have broken through the back part and have escaped said i so i walked round their little houses but everything was right nothing had gone outside through the walls in order to make sure i came again to the door and shouted nobody here the same silence i lay flat on the ground put my head inside of the door and again shouted nobody here it was so dark inside that coming from the light i could not see so i extended my arm in order to feel if there was any one within sweeping my arm from left to right at first i touched an empty bed composed of three sticks then feeling carefully i moved my arm gradually toward the right when hallo what do i feel a leg which i immediately grabbed above the ankle and a piercing shriek startled me it was the leg of a human being and that human being a dwarf i had got hold of a dwarf don't be afraid the spirit will do you no harm said my ashango guide 
don't be afraid i said in the ashango language and i immediately pulled the creature i had seized by the leg through the door in the midst of great excitement among my comi men a dwarf i shouted as the little creature came out a woman i shouted again a pygmy the little creature shrieked looking at me nechende 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 said she oh 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 yo 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 and her piercing wail rent the air what a sight i had never seen the like what said i now i do see the dwarfs of equatorial africa the dwarfs of homer herodotus the dwarfs of the ancients how queer the little old woman looked how frightened she was she trembled all over she was neither white nor black she was of a yellow or mulatto colour what a little head what a little body what a little hand what a little foot i exclaimed oh what queer-looking hair said i bewildered the hair grew on the head in little tufts apart from each other and the face was as wrinkled as a baked apple i cannot tell you how delighted i was at my discovery so giving my little prize to one of the ashangos and ordering my comi men to catch her if she tried to run away i went to the other little dwelling where i thought i had seen another of the dwarfs hide himself the two little huts stood close together i shouted nobody here no answer then i did what i had done before and getting my head inside of the hut through the door again shouted nobody here no answer i moved my right hand to see if i could feel anybody when lo i seized a leg and immediately heard a shriek i pulled another strange little dwarf out of the door it was also a woman not quite so old as the first but having exactly the same appearance the two dwarf women looked at each other and began to cry and sing mournful songs as if they expected to be killed i said to them be not frightened then the ashangos called to the last dwarf who had hid to come out that it was no use i had seen them all they had hardly spoken when i saw a little head peeping out of the door and my ashangos made the creature come out it was a woman also who began crying and the trio shrieked and cried and cried and shrieked wringing their hands till they got tired they thought their last day had come don't be afraid said the ashangos the aguizi is a good aguizi don't be afraid said my comi men after a while they stopped crying and began to look at me more quietly for the first time i was able to look carefully at these little dwarfs they were yellow their faces being exactly the same colour as the chimpanzee the palms of their hands were almost as white as those of white people they seemed well proportioned but their eyes had an untamable wildness that struck me at once they had thick lips and flat noses like the negroes their foreheads were low and narrow and their cheekbones prominent and their hair which grew in little short tufts was black with a reddish tinge after a while i thought i heard a rustling in one of the little houses so i went there and looking inside saw it filled with the tiniest children they were exceedingly shy when they saw me they hid their heads just as young dogs or kittens would do and got into a huddle and kept still these were the little dwarfish children who had remained in the village under the care of the three women while the dwarfs had gone into the forest to collect their evening meal that is to say nuts fruits and berries and to see if the traps they had set had caught any game i immediately put beads around the necks of the women gave them a leg of wild boar and some plantains and told them to tell their people to remain and not to be afraid i gave some meat to the little children who as soon as i showed it to them seized it just in the same manner that fighting joe or ugly tom would have done only instead of fighting they ran away immediately very queer specimens these little children seemed to be they were if anything lighter in colour than the older people and they were such little bits of things that they reminded me i could not help it of the chimpanzees and the neshiego babubes i had captured at different times though their heads were much larger i waited in vain the other inhabitants did not come back they were afraid of me i told the women that the next day i should return and bring them meat for they are said to be very fond of it and plenty of beads after several visits to the settlement of the dwarfs we became friends but it took time my great friend among them was masunda an old woman the first one i had seen and whom i pulled out of her own house but i had some trouble before i could tame friend masunda 
one day i thought i would surprise the dwarfs and come on them unawares without having told my friend masunda i was coming when i made my appearance i just caught a glimpse of her feet as she was running into her house that was all i saw of masunda at all the other huts little branches of trees had been stuck up in front to show that the inmates were out and that their doors were shut and that nobody could get in these were indeed queer doors i had never seen the like they were of little use except for keeping out the dogs and wild beasts when i went in masunda's hut and got hold of her she pretended to have been asleep so after all these little dwarfs said i know how to lie and how to deceive just as well as other people upon one of my visits to the village i saw two other women a man and two children all the other obongos had gone so i made friends with them by giving them meat and beads i saw that the women were not the mothers of the children i looked at the doors of all the huts they all had branches put at the entrance to signify that the owner was out i do not know why but i began to suspect that the mother of the children was in the settlement and close by where they stood i had my eyes upon one of the little houses as the one where she was hiding so i put aside the branches at the entrance and putting half of my body into the hut i succeeded in discovering in the dark something which i recognized after a while as a human being don't be afraid i said don't be afraid repeated my ashango guides the creature was a woman she came out with a sad countenance and began to weep she had over her forehead a broad stripe of yellow ochre she was a widow and had buried her husband only a few days before where is the burial ground of the dwarfs i asked of my ashango guides ask her said i to them no spirit said they for if you ask them such a question these dwarfs will fear you more than ever and you will never see them any more they will flee far away into the thickest part of the forest we ashango people do not know even where they bury their dead they have no regular burial ground how could they added my guide for they roam in the forest like the gorilla the nishiego mabube the kulu kamba and the nishiego i believe said the ashango that all these dwarfs have come from the same father and the same mother long long ago another time i came to the village of the obongos with two legs of goats a leg of wild boar ten house rats which had been trapped a large dead snake and two land turtles which i intended to give as a feast to the obongos rebuka makanda and igalo were with me and several ashango women accompanied us we had several bunches of plantain for i resolved to give them a regular banquet and we had set out to have a good time in their settlement i had brought beads a looking-glass some spoons knives forks and one of my little geneva musical boxes guns were also to be fired for i was going to show the dwarfs what the oguizi could do when they saw us with food they received us with great joy what a queer language i thought these dwarfs have there was a wild dwarf hurrah ya ye yo owa owa ki ke ki when they saw the good things that were to be eaten nearly all the dwarfs were here very few of them were absent masunda who was my friend and who seemed to be less afraid of me than anybody else stood by me and kept her eyes upon the meat there were fifty-nine dwarfs all told including men women children and babies what little things the babies were smoke came out of every hut fires were lighted all round nuts were roasting berries and fruits had been collected in great abundance and snake flesh was plentiful for the dwarfs had been the day before on a feeding excursion rats and mice had also been trapped abongo said i we have come to have a good time first i am going to give to every one of you beads then the ashangos brought before them a basket containing the beads and i asked who was the chief i could not find him and they would not tell me among them were several old people the dwarfs were now eager for beads and surrounded me and though i am a man of short stature i seemed a giant in the midst of them and as for rebuka and igolo they appeared to be colossal ya ya yo yo ye qui quo o a ri ri ke ki ke ki seemed to be the only sounds they could make in their excitement their appearance was singular indeed the larger number of them being of a dirty yellow colour 
a few of them were not more than four feet in height others were from four feet two inches to four feet seven inches in height but if they were short in size they were stoutly built like chimpanzees they had big broad chests and though their legs were small they were muscular and strong their arms were also strong in proportion to their size there were grey-headed men and grey-headed wrinkled old women among them and very hideous the old dwarfs were their features resembled very closely the features of a young chimpanzee some had grey others hazel eyes while the eyes of a few were black as i have said before their hair was not like that of the negroes and ashangos among whom the dwarfs lived but grew in little short tufts apart from each other and the hair after attaining a certain length could not grow longer these little tufts looked like so many little balls of wool many of the men had their chest and legs covered with these little tufts of woolly hair the women's hair was no longer than that of the men and it grew exactly in the same manner i could not keep my eyes from the tiny babies they were ridiculously small and much lighter in colour than the older people their mothers had a broad string of leather hanging from their shoulders to carry them in there was great excitement among them as i distributed the beads and they would shout look at his de Jeevi nose look at his muna mouth look at his liaru head look at his nechuie hair look at his mishu beard and in spite of my big moustache they would shout is he a bangla ogwezi man spirit or an ogwezi mokasho woman spirit some declared that i was a mokasho others that i was a bagala i did not forget my friend masunda after i had given them beads i took out a large looking-glass which i had hidden and put it in front of them immediately they trembled with fright and said spirit don't kill us and turned their heads from the looking-glass then the musical box was shown and when i had set it playing the dwarfs lay down on the ground frightened by the brilliant sparkling music of the mechanism and by turns looked at me and at the box some of them ran away into their little huts after their fears were allayed i showed them a string of six little bells which i shook whereat their little eyes brightened and their joy was unbounded when i gave them the bells one of course was for friend masunda who hung it by a cord to a race and shook her body in order to make it ring after this i ordered igalo to bring me the meat and taking from my sheath my big bright sharp hunting knife i cut it and distributed it among the dwarfs then i gave them the plantains and told them to eat i wish you had seen the twisting of their mouths it would have made you laugh immediately the little dwarfs scattered round their fires and roasted the food i had given them and it was no sooner cooked than it was eaten they seemed to be so fond of flesh when they had finished eating the obongos seemed more sociable than i had ever seen them before i seated myself on a dead limb of a tree and they came round me and asked me to talk to them as the spirits talk so i took my journal and read to them in english and what i had written the day before after speaking to them in the language of the aguizis i said now talk to me in the language of the dwarfs and pointing to my fingers i gave them to understand that i wanted to know how they counted so a dwarf taking hold of his hand and then one finger after another counted one moi two bay three matato four digit mabongo five digio six samuna seven nichima eight nisamuna nine nichimuma ten mabota and then raised his hands intimating that he could not count beyond ten one of them asked me if i lived in the sungui moon then another if i lived in a yechi star another if i had been long in the forest did i make the fine things i gave them during the night now bongos i said to them i want you to sing and to dance the dwarf dance for me an old dwarf went out and took out of his hut a nagoma tam-tam and began to beat it then the people struck up a chant and what queer singing it was what shrill voices they had after a while they got excited and began to dance all the while gesticulating wildly leaping up and kicking backwards and forwards and shaking their heads then i fired two guns the noise of which seemed to stun them and fill them with fear i gave them to understand that when i saw an elephant a leopard a gorilla or any living thing by making that noise i could kill them and to show them i could do it i brought down a bird perched on a high tree near their settlement 
how astonished they seemed to be after all i said to myself though low in the scale of intelligence like their more civilized fellow-men these little creatures can dance and sing now bongos that you have asked me about the oguizis i said to them tell me about yourselves why do you not build villages as other people do oh said they we do not build villages for we never like to remain long in the same place for if we did we should soon starve when we have gathered all the fruits nuts and berries around the place where we have been living for a time and trapped all the game there is in the region and food is becoming scarce we move off to some other part of the forest we love to move we hate to tarry long at the same spot we love to be free like the antelopes and gazelles why don't you plant for food as other people do i asked them why should we work said they when there are plenty of fruits berries and nuts around us when there is game in the woods and fish in the rivers and snakes rats and mice are plentiful we love the berries the nuts and the fruits which grow wild much better than the fruits the big people raise on their plantations and if we had villages they said the strong and tall people who live in the country might come and make war upon us kill us and capture us they do not desire to kill you i said to them see how friendly they are with you when you trap much game you exchange it for plantains with them why don't you wear clothing why said they the fire is our means of keeping warm and then the big people give us their grass cloth when they have done wearing it why don't you work iron and make spears and battle axes so that you might be able to defend yourselves and be not afraid of war we do not know how to work iron it takes too much time it is too hard work we can make bows and we make arrows with hard wood and can poison them we know how to make traps to trap game and we trap game in far greater number than we can kill it when we go hunting and we love to go hunting why don't you make bigger cabins we do not want to make bigger cabins it would be too much trouble and we do not know how these are good enough for us they keep the rain from us and we build them so rapidly don't the leopards sometimes come and eat some of you yes they do they exclaim then we move off far away several days journey from where the leopards have come to eat some of us and often we make traps to catch them we hate the leopards the obongo shouted with one voice how do you make your fires tell me and i could not help thinking that however wild a man was even though he might be apparently little above the chimpanzee he had always a fire and knew how to make it they showed me flint stones and a species of oakum coming from the palm tree and said they knocked these stones against each other and the sparks gave them fire then to astonish them i took a match from my match-box and lighted it as soon as they saw the flame a wild shout rang through the settlement abongos tell me said i how you get your wives for your settlements are far apart and you have no paths leading through the forest from one to another you never know how far the next settlement of the dwarfs may be from yours it is true said they that sometimes we do not know where the next encampment of the obongos may be and we do not wish to know for sometimes we fight among ourselves and if we live near together we should become too numerous and find it difficult to procure berries and game our people never leave one settlement for another generation after generation we have lived among ourselves and married among ourselves it is but seldom we permit a stranger from another abongo settlement to come among us how far said i pointing to the east do you meet abongos far far away they answered toward where the sun rises abongos are found scattered in the great forest we love the woods for there we live and if we were to live anywhere else we should starve as you wander through the forest i asked don't you sometimes come to prairies yes said they and here an old abongo addressed himself to my ashango interpreter when i was a boy we had our settlement for a long time in the forest not far from a big prairie and farther off there was a big river since then said the old abongo as we moved we have turned our backs upon where the sun rises and marched in the direction where the sun sets which meant that they have been migrating from the east toward the west as the time of our departure from niembuai had arrived i said to the dwarfs that i must bid them good-bye for i was going away toward where the sun rises now you see said i you have always been afraid of me tell me have i done harm to any one of you no no they exclaimed no no said my friend misunda so i shook hands with them and they said to me in parting you will see more little dwarfs in the countries where you are going be kind to them as you have been to us
End of section 73 this recording is in the public domain section 74 of egypt africa and arabia this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the world's story volume three egypt africa and arabia edited by eva march tappan section seventy four crossing an african bridge about eighteen sixty eight by paul du chaillu toward noon we approached the ovigui river a mountain torrent which had now swollen into a river and before reaching its natural banks we had to pass through a swamp in the forest for half an hour the torrent had overflowed and its waters were running swiftly down among the trees i began to wonder how we were to cross the bridge the ashiras had been speaking of that bridge and in fact we had delayed our start two or three days because they said the waters were too high at last we came to a spot where the ground was dry and a little way farther i could see the swift waters of the ovigui gliding down with great speed through the forest i saw at once that even an expert swimmer would be helpless here and would be dashed to pieces against the fallen trees which jutted out in every direction not being a very good swimmer i did not enjoy the sight there was one consolation no crocodile could stand this current and these pleasant gentlemen had therefore retired to parts unknown i wanted all the time to get a glimpse of the bridge but had not succeeded in doing so i called mincho who pointed out to me a queer structure which he called the bridge it was nothing but a creeper stretched from one side to the other then mincho told me that some years before the bed of the river was not where we stood but some hundred yards over the other side this he said is one of the tricks of the ovigui i found that several other of these mountain streams have the same trick of course mincho said that there was a muiri a spirit who took the river and changed its course for nothing else could do it but a spirit the deep channel of the ovigui seemed to me about thirty yards wide now in this new bed stood certain trees which native ingenuity saw could be used as piers for a bridge at this point in the stream there were two trees opposite each other and about seven or eight yards distant from each shore other trees on the banks were so cut as to fall upon these which might have been called the piers so a gap had been filled on each side it now remained to unite the still open space in the centre between the two piers and here came the tug unable to transport heavy pieces of timber they had thrown across this chasm a long slender bending limb which they fastened securely to the piers of course no one could walk on this without assistance so a couple of strong vines lianas had been strung across for balustrades these were about three or four feet above the bridge and about one foot higher up the stream i could barely see the vine and my heart failed me as i stood looking at this breakneck or drowning concern to add to the pleasurable excitement mincho told me that on a bridge below half a dozen people had been drowned the year before by tumbling into the river they were careless in crossing added mincho or some person had bewitched them the waters of the ovigui ran down so fast that looking at them for any length of time made my head dizzy i was in a pretty fix i could certainly not back out i preferred to run the risk of being drowned rather than to show these ashira i was afraid and to tell them that we had better go back i think i should never have dared to look them in the face afterward the whole country would have known that i had been afraid the aguizi would have then been nowhere a coward i should have been called by the savages rather die i thought than to have such a reputation i am sure all the boys who read this book would have had the same feelings and that girls could never look at a boy who is not possessed of courage the party had got ready and put their loads as high on their backs as they could and in such a manner that these loads should slip into the river if an accident were to happen the crossing began and i watched them carefully they did not look straight across but faced the current which was tremendous 
the water reached to their waists and the current was so swift that their bodies could not remain erect but were bent in two they held on to the creeper and advanced slowly sideways never raising their feet from the bridge for if they had done otherwise the current would have carried them off the structure one of the men slipped when midway but luckily recovered himself he dropped his load among the articles in which were two pairs of shoes but he held on to the rope and finished the journey by crossing one arm over the other it was a curious sight we shouted hold on fast to the rope hold on fast the noise and shouting we did was enough to make one deaf another carrying one of my guns so narrowly escaped falling as to drop that which was also swept off and lost meantime i wondered if i should follow in the wake of my shoes and gun at any rate i was bound to show the ashira that i was not afraid to cross the bridge even as i have said at the risk of being drowned it would have been a pretty thing to have these people believe that i was susceptible of fear the next thing would have been that i should have been plundered then murdered these fellows had a great advantage over me their garments did not trouble them at last all were across but minsho aduma and myself i had stripped to my shirt and trousers and set out on my trial followed by minsho who had a vague idea that if i slipped he might catch me aduma went ahead before reaching the bridge i had to wade in the muddy water then i went upon it and marched slowly against the tide never raising my feet till at last i came to the tree there the current was tremendous i thought it would carry my legs off the bridge which was now three feet under the water i felt the water beating against my legs and waist i advanced carefully feeling my way and slipping my feet along without raising them the current was so strong that my arms were extended to their utmost length and the water as it struck against my body bent it the water was really cold but despite of that perspiration fell from my face i was so excited i managed to drag myself to the other side holding fast to the creeper having made up my mind never to let go as long as i should have strength to hold on should my feet give way i intended to do like the other man and get over by crossing one arm over the other at last weak and pale with excitement but outwardly calm i reached the other side vowing that i would never try such navigation again i would rather have faced several gorillas lions elephants and leopards than cross the ovigui bridge putting ourselves in walking order again we plunged into the great forest which was full of ebony barwood india rubber and other strange trees about two miles from the ovigui we reached a little prairie some miles long and a few hundred yards wide which the natives called ajolo it seemed like a little island encased in that great sea of trees what a nice little spot it would have been to build a camp under some of the tall long spread branches of trees which bordered it but there was no time for camping there were to be no stops during the daytime till we reached the apingi country a few miles after leaving the ajiolo prairie we came to a steep hill called mount okonku as we ascended we had to lay hold of the branches in order to help ourselves in the ascent and we had to stop several times in order to get our breath we finally reached a plateau from which we could see the kumu nabuali mountains then we surmounted the other hills with intervening plains and valleys all covered with dense forest and at last found ourselves on the banks of a most beautiful little purling mountain brook which skirted the base of our last hill this nice little stream was called the alumi or olumi here we lit our fires built shelters and camped for the night all feeling perfectly tired out and i for one thankful for the nice camp we had succeeded in building for i needed a good night's rest end of section seventy four this recording is in the public domain Section seventy five of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Thomas Peter. The World Story, Volume Three Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section seventy five. Consulting the Man in the Moon about eighteen sixty eight by paul du chaillou the people declared they must find some means of ascertaining the cause of the king's sufferings 
King Giza had sent word himself that his people might try to find out from Ilogu why he was sick, and what he must do for his recovery. Ilogu is believed by the people to be a spirit living in the moon, a mighty spirit who looks down upon the inhabitants of the earth, a spirit to whom the black man can talk. Yes, they said, Ilogu's face can be seen. Look at it. Then they pointed out to me the spots on the moon which we can see with our naked eye. These spots were the indistinct features of the spirit. One fine evening, at full moon, for to consult Ilogo, the moon must be full, or nearly so, the women of the village assembled in front of the king's house. Clustered close together, and seated on the ground, with their faces turned toward the moon, they sang songs. They were surrounded by the men of the village. I shall not soon forget that wild scene. The sky was clear and beautiful. The moon shone in its brightness, eclipsing by its light that of the stars, except those of the first magnitude. The air was calm and serene, and the shadows of the tall trees upon the earth appeared like queer phantoms. The songs of the women were too, and in praise of Ilogo, the spirit that lived in Ugueli, the moon. Presently a woman seated herself in the center of the circle of singers and began a solo, gazing steadfastly at the moon, the people every now and then singing in chorus with her. She was to be inspired by the spirit Ilogo to utter prophecies. At last she gave up singing, for she could not get into a trance. Then another woman took her place, in the midst of the most vociferous singing that could be done by human lips. After a while the second woman gave place to a third, a little woman, wiry and nervous. She seated herself like the others, and looked steadily at the moon, crying out that she could see a logo, and then the singing redoubled in fury. The excitement of the people had at that time become very great. The drums beat furiously, the drummers using all their strength until covered with perspiration. The outsiders shouted madly and seemed to be almost out of their senses, for their faces were wrinkled in nervous excitement, their eyes perfectly wild, and the contortions they made with their bodies indescribable. The excitement was now intense, and the noise horrible. The songs to Ilogo were not for a moment discontinued, but the pitch of their voices was so great and so hoarse that the words at last seemed to come with difficulty. The medium, the women, and the men all sang with one accord. E logo, we ask thee, tell who has bewitched the king. E logo, we ask thee, what shall we do to cure the king? The forests are thine, E logo, the rivers are thine, E logo, the moon is thine. O moon, O moon, O moon, thou art the home of Ilogo. Shall the king die, O Ilogo, O Ilogo? O moon, O moon. These words were repeated over and over, the people getting more terribly excited as they went on. The woman who was the medium, and who had been singing violently, looked toward the moon and began to tremble. Her nerves twitched, her face was contorted, her muscles swelled, and at last her limbs straightened out. At this time the wildest of all wild excitement possessed the people. I myself looked on with intense curiosity. She fell on her back on the ground, insensible, her face turned up to the moon. She looked as if she had died in a fit. The song to Ilogo continued with more noise than ever, but at last comparative quiet followed, compelled, I believe, by sheer exhaustion from excitement, for the people were all gazing intently on the woman's face. I shall not forget that scene by moonlight nor the corpse-like face of that woman, so still and calm. How wild it all looked! The woman, who lay apparently dead before the savages, was expected at this time to see things in the world of Ilogo, that is to say, the moon, to see the great spirit Ilogo himself. And, as she lay insensible, she was supposed to be holding intercourse with him. Then, after she had conversed with the great spirit Ilogo, she would awake, and tell the people all she saw, and all that Ilogo had said to her. For my part, I thought she really was dead, 
I approached her and touched her pulse. It was weak, but there was life. After about half an hour of insensibility, she came to her senses, but she was much prostrated. She seated herself without rising, looking round as if stupefied. She remained quite silent for a while, and then began to speak. I have seen Ilogo. I have spoken to Ilogo. Ilogo has told me that Kingiza, our king, shall not die, that Kingiza is going to live a long time, that Kingiza was not bewitched, and that a remedy prepared from such a plant, I forget the name, would cure him. Then, she added, I went to sleep, and when I awoke, Ilogo was gone, and now I find myself in the midst of you. The people then quietly separated, as by that time it was late, and all retired to their huts, I myself going to mine, thinking of the wild scene I had just witnessed, and feeling that, the longer I remained in that strange country, the more strange the customs of the people appeared to me. Soon all became silent, and nothing but the barking of the watchful little native dogs broke the stillness of the night. The moon continued to shine over that village, the inhabitants of which had run so wild with superstition. End of section 75 This recording is in the public domain. Section 76 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. Read for LibriVox.org. Du Shayu the First, King of the Apingi, about 1868, by Paul Du Shayu. The village was crowded with strangers once more. All the chiefs of the tribe had arrived. What did it all mean? They had the wildest notions regarding me. I was the most wonderful of creatures, a mighty spirit. I could work wonders, turn wood into iron, leaves of trees into cloth, earth into beads, the waters of the Rembo Apingi into palm wine or plantain wine. I could make fire, the matches I lighted being proof of it. What had that immense crowd come for? They had met to make me their king a uh, kendo the insignia of chieftain's ship here had been procured from the shimba people from whose country the kendo comes the drums beat early this morning it seemed as if a fete day was coming for every one appeared joyous i was quite unprepared for the ceremony that was to take place for i knew nothing about it no one had breathed a word concerning it to me when the hour arrived i was called out of my hut wild shouts rang through the air as i made my appearance yo 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 the chiefs of the tribe headed by ramanji advanced toward me in line each chief being armed with a spear the heads of which they held pointed at me in rear of the chiefs were hundreds of apingi warriors also armed with spears were they to spear me they stopped while the drummers beat their tam-tams furiously then ramanji holding a kendo in his hand came forward in the midst of the greatest excitement and wild shouts of the oguizi is to be made our king the oguizi is to be made our king when ramanji stood about a yard from me a dead silence took place the king advanced another step and then with his right hand put the kendo on my left shoulder saying you are the spirit whom we have never seen before we are but poor people when we see you you are one of those of whom we have heard who came from nobody knows where and whom we never expected to see you are our king we make you our king stay with us always for we love you whereupon shouts as wild as the country around came from the multitude they shouted spirit we do not want you to go away we want you for ever immense quantities of palm wine contained in calabashes were drunk and a general jollification took place in the orthodox fashion of a coronation from that day therefore i may call myself du jayu the first king of the pingi 
just fancy i am an african king of all the wild castles i ever built when i was a boy i never dreamed that i should one day be made king over a wild tribe of negroes dwelling in the mountains of equatorial africa end of section seventy six this recording is in the public domain section seventy seven of egypt africa and arabia read for librivox .org. south africa historical note the transvaal was settled chiefly by the dutch their descendants are known as boers or farmers they came at first to cape colony in the napoleonic wars cape colony fell into the hands of the english the boers were not pleased with british rule and made the grand trek first to natal then to the orange free state then still farther into the wilderness to the transvaal or across the Vaal. for a quarter of a century there was peace but in eighteen hundred seventy seven some of the people of the transvaal asked england for help in their wars against the natives thereupon england planted her flag in the transvaal the boers rebelled and in several battles the british were defeated noticeably at mjuba hill where they met with a terrible slaughter the Boer Republic was restored, but England retained all control in foreign affairs. Before this time, both gold and diamonds had been discovered in this region, and foreign miners and traders flocked to the country. Soon, these foreigners greatly outnumbered the Dutchmen. The Boers were not pleased. They laid heavy taxes upon the unwelcome outlanders, and refused them political rights. The mutual dissatisfaction resulted in war england sent larger armies than she had ever before put into the field but it was not until nineteen hundred and two that after three years of most determined warfare the little republic was subdued end of section seventy seven this recording is in the public domain section seventy eight of egypt africa and arabia Read for LibriVox.org by phone. The Lost Trek by Sir John Everett Millay, English painter, 1829 to 1896. Painting, page 436. This picture symbolizes the indomitable pioneer spirit of the Anglo Saxon race, the spirit that has driven them forth to conquer the waste places of the world and has given England a chain of territorial possessions encircling the earth an englishman has ventured into the great upland plain of south africa a region given over until recently to savages and wild beasts he had set out to find a home in the wilderness but has been overtaken on the way by sickness and has lain down on a lonely veld to die friends and family are far away but two natives his sole companions sit beside him waiting patiently for the end the life's journey of this pioneer is over but others are ready to step forward and take his place in the vanguard of civilization such were the men that conquered and cleared the land opened up its great mineral wealth and turned the african wilderness into a prosperous english commonwealth end of section seventy eight this recording is in the public domain